Good evening. <laughs> My name is Tamara Piety, Associate Dean uh, for the Faculty of Development and Professor of Law at the University of Tulsa College of Law. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Tulsa for the 12th annual Buck Colbert Franklin Memorial Civil Rights Lecture. This lecture series was established to deepen public discussion of civil rights and to honor the memory of a gifted attorney who represented many victims of the 1921 Tulsa riots, Buck Colbert Franklin, one of the first black attorneys in Oklahoma. At great personal sacrifice, Franklin defended the black community and fought back against racial injustices displayed during this very volatile time in our history. We owe a debt of gratitude to his son, the distinguished historian of the South, uh, the late John Hope Franklin, who delivered the inaugural lecture of this series in October of 2000 and attended many of the subsequent lectures. As we carry forward in the spirit of um, those many, out we welcome, we are proud to welcome many outstanding jurists, uh, mentors, and friends to join us in tonight's presentation. Time does not permit me to recognize all of you, but I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the University of Tulsa Board of Trustees, the University of Tulsa College of Law Alumni Board, the University of Tul uh, Tulsa College of Law faculty and donors who made this lecture series possible. Since its inception, the Buck Franklin Lecture Series has been a source of enlightenment, enlightenment and inspiration, encouraging us to seek victories, great and small, in the interests of equal justice for all. That is the highest calling of our profession, and tonight we are pleased to extend that tradition as we welcome this year's Buck Franklin Lecture. Dr. Jennifer Aberhart received a PhD in psychology from Harvard University in 1993. Before coming to Stanford in 1998, she held a joint faculty position at Yale University in psychology and African and African American studies, where she was also a research fellow at Yale Center for Race, Inequality, and Politics. At Stanford, she's conducted programs of research in areas ranging from social uh, neuroscience to the intersection of psychology and law. Her work examines how social representations of race can affect visual perception and neural processing. In 2002, she received a Distinguished Alumni Award, alumni award for this research from the University of Cincinnati, where she completed her undergraduate education. Dr. Eberhardt is a co-director of the Mind, Culture, and Society Specialization Track for Advanced Psychology Undergraduates in, at Stanford. She has served on the Committee of Visitors for the National Science Foundation, the Association for Psychological Science, the American Psychological Association, the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, and the Society for Psychological Study of Social Issues. I first became aware of uh, Dr. Everhart's work through her work along with Dr. Claude Steele on a phenomenon dubbed stereotype threat. This is the theory of, uh, that anxiety about confirming negative stereotypes about oneself or one's group can cause one to um, underperform on a task such as a standardized test, a GRE, LSAT. A substantial body of research um, offers evidence to, to support this theory. Um, I then encountered her again at a conference at Harvard, sponsored by Harvard Center for Mind Sciences and the Law, where she's discussed some of her work, and I was it was a dramatic and compelling talk, and I hoped that we would be able to get her to Tulsa, and I'm delighted that we've been able to do so. It could not be more timely, coming as it does on the heels of the tragic events of two weeks ago. And in the wake of that case, it's clear that we need to talk more about issues of stereotyping and the ways in which it can insidiously insinuate itself into our life, into our decision making, without necessarily involving conscious awareness. Most of the racism that we face today does not take the form of cross burning or overt acts of ra uh, racial prejudice, but more subtly in the fabric of everyday decisions, small and large, that rely on some of these processes. Dr. Everhart has made issues of stereotyping prejudice, stigma, and its attendance costs, individual, personal, and societal, the subject of her studies. Her work illustrates how policies which are nominally colorblind but which fail to take account of existing social narratives, culture, and psychology can in, uh, end up reinforcing the status quo. Help me welcome Dr. Jennifer Everhart. Thank 
you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And um, it's just uh, such a pleasure to be here. I've never been to the state of Oklahoma before, but I hear a lot of people say that, I guess. <laughs> so I'm pleased to uh, be invited here to uh, participate in the Buck Franklin Lecture Series. And I, I feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to learn uh, about the life of Buck Franklin. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Barbette, I, I don't know where she is, um, just uh, for um, being kind enough to send me the autobiography. Um, as you all know, uh, Buck Franklin was a pioneer. Um, and like most pioneers, he is described as an observant witness. Uh, he was an observant witness not only to the uh, changes uh, in law and culture that um, transformed Tulsa, uh, but to the changes that swept uh, through the broader Southwest. Today, I will talk about some of the empirical studies uh, that I've conducted that are relevant um, to the law and um, social change. Uh, yet before I do, I would uh, like uh, you uh, to play the role of the observant witness. Um, it just so happens that I have a 30 second video uh, clip with me. It's a silent clip. And I want to play it for you. And um, as you watch, you'll, you'll witness um, people passing a basketball. And there are two teams um, depicted, one in light colored shirts and one in dark colored shirts. And I'm going to show you uh, this now. And as I do, I want you to count the number of passes uh, made by the team in the light colored shirts, OK? Um, so I want you to focus, uh, concentrate as hard as you can so you can give me an accurate number of passes at the end, OK? You guys ready? Okay, so uh, how many, so, so how many people have seen this video before, just so I can get it, uh, how many have not seen the video, okay, so about half, okay, so, um, so the people who have not seen the video before, how, how many passes did you count? 17. 17? 18. 18. 18. I lost track. With you lost track? <laughs> <laughs> how, how many say 18? You saw 10? Okay, so there are 18. So you guys are really good. You, only three people saw there are 18 passes. Go ahead. What counts as a pass? <laughs> <laughs> Anytime they release the ball, so it could be an aerial or a bounce pass, like any any pass. Well, you said the team in the white shirt, right? Yeah. But yeah. What, is it, what if they pass it to somebody in a black shirt? Because that happens. Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> we, well, we don't need to analyze it at that level of detail, but <laughs> if you count at 18 passes, you're like, roughly, that's about right. <laughs> so, um, so did anybody, as you were counting the passes for people who haven't seen the video before, did you uh, notice anything unusual? <laughs> the guy in the bear suit. There was a bear? Okay. Or somebody in a okay. furry suit. The, there was a gorilla. Okay. So how many people uh, noticed a gorilla? So, all right. So how many people did not notice any gorilla? Okay. So a fair number of people did not notice a gorilla. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replay this. It's, it's, um, I'm going to show you the same videotape. It's not, um, I didn't slow it down or speed it up or anything. It's exactly what you just saw. Uh, but this time, as you uh, watch, don't count any passes. Just um, watch it without, without counting. <laughs> okay, so everybody saw the gorilla that time, right? Okay, so there was a gorilla uh, that walked across the screen. However, typically only about half of the people notice the gorilla when they're shown this film. And they miss the gorilla because the gorilla, um, the, the, the gorilla is invisible because the, their attention is directed elsewhere. Okay, and in cognitive psychology, this phenomenon is known as inattentional blindness. 
Okay, the, the idea here is that our minds are uh, simply not built to attend to every single object that appears before us, no matter how distinctive that object might be. So objects become visible and invisible to us based on our goals, based on our expectations, and, and based on what we already know to be true about the world. Which is why eyewitness testimony is so true. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, as uh, William James, uh, the father of psychology, uh, famously noted, attention creates no idea. An idea must already be there before we can attend to it. Attention only fixes and retains what the ordinary laws of association bring before the footlights of consciousness. So what are the ideas about African Americans that have stuck with us and continue to infect our vision of the world. There are several ideas uh, that I'll talk about today. Um, the idea that blacks are criminal, the idea that blacks are less than human, and the idea that blacks are static beings incapable of change. All of these ideas have a long history and they continue to wield extraordinary power, especially in the arena of criminal justice. The stereotype of blacks as hostile, dangerous, and criminal is one of the strongest stereotypes of blacks in American society. It shows up in study after study. Um, across decades, this has shown up. And although not everyone actively endorses this stereotype, nearly everyone has knowledge of its existence in our society. Actual crime statistics contribute to an association of race and crime. As we know, uh, black males are grossly overrepresented in prisons and in jails uh, relative to their numbers in the population. And racial disparities like these have not escaped the popular press. Um, we hear these disparities reported over and over in news reports across the nation. So we have these stereotypic beliefs and we have these, um, this uh, intense racial stratification working together to support and strengthen uh, this association between blacks and crime. So I'm going to take you through a series of empirical studies now and these studies will target various points in the criminal justice system from the very first encounter police um, officers have with the suspect to the sentences that jurors deliver. And using these studies I will demonstrate that at each point the black crime association uh, can influence how we think, how we reason, and how we literally see. So in the first study um, I will show you uh, that blacks are so associated with crime that the mere presence of a black face can cause people to see weapons better. This association is so strong that it can determine which objects we see in the world and which objects we don't. So to examine this, uh, we invited undergraduates into the laboratory uh, to participate in a study and the participants um, uh, we had them sit in front of a computer screen and they were asked to perform two supposedly unrelated tasks. And for the first task, uh, participants saw this focus dot at the center of the screen. Then they saw these flashes of light appear around that focus dot. And their goal was to indicate with a button push um, which side of the computer screen each flash of light appeared on and to do that as quickly as possible. Now these flashes were actually the faces of young men that were appearing on the screen at such a rapid rate that participants couldn't consciously detect them. Okay? Uh, now I'm going to show you the same thing in slow motion here. So this is what they're actually seeing. So the participants were either exposed to an entire series of black male faces or to an entire series of white male faces or to no faces at all. Now exposing people to images that are beneath their conscious awareness is called subliminal priming. And after the subliminal priming technique, um, we uh, asked participants to perform this supposedly unrelated object recognition task. And for this task, um, participants were presented with a series of objects on the computer screen. And um, these objects appeared on the computer screen one at a time, and each object was severely degraded. And slowly, in 41 steps or 41 frames, uh, it became more clear uh, what the object was. So here's an example here. At frame one, the object is fuzzy. I'm just showing you key points along the continuum here so that you can see by frame 41, that object is clear. You know what that object is. 
Okay, now the participant's goal for this task was to indicate with the button push the point at which they could recognize what each object was. Some of these objects were crime relevant, like guns and knives, and others were crime irrelevant, like staplers and cameras and so forth. So participants were either exposed to um, an entire series of black male faces, white male faces, or no faces at all, and then all of them performed this object recognition task with both objects that were crime relevant and objects that were crime irrelevant. And we hypothesized that those participants who had been exposed to those black male faces beforehand would be faster to recognize those uh, crime objects. Okay, so let's look at the results here. Along the vertical axis, we had the frame number at which they could recognize the object, and that's going from frame one where it's blurry to frame 41 where it's clear. And first, we're going to look at what happens with the crime irrelevant objects. Well, you can see here that exposing them to the faces makes no difference, right? Um, they're recognizing these crime irrelevant objects at about the same point of, on the continuum, whether it's a black face or a white face that they were exposed to beforehand. They're recognizing these objects at about the midpoint of the continuum. Um, now let's look at how people respond to the crime objects. Look at what happens when people are simply exposed to black male faces. All of a sudden, they need less information, a lot less information to tell what that object is. Um, they need fewer frames to say, oh, that's a gun or that's a knife, okay? And you get just the opposite effect with previous exposure to the white male faces, okay? So exposure to the black male faces facilitated the detection of the crime objects, whereas exposure to the white faces inhibited the detection of those very same crime objects. Go ahead. Uh, are these all white people that are your... No, they're, they're white and non-white. So um, you're saying African Americans and Caucasians are included in the sample of the observer. And, and everybody shows the same pattern. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'll say, I mean, th throughout the talk and many of the studies um, that I'll show you, the, the, the race of the participant doesn't make a difference. And we want to argue um, that you're, we get these effects, um, you know, not, that these effects don't rely on prejudice or animus or, or sort of, you know, um, you know outgroup bias uh, necessarily in, in, in the sense that it's, um, you know, this sort of um, hatred or something. It, it has more to do with, uh, um, you know, picking up um, these associations in society, your knowledge of sort of what goes with what or what correlates uh, with what, it's exposure um, to um, these associations rather than uh, animus. So, okay, all right, any other questions about this? All right, um, so, so far we've um, demonstrated that when people think black, uh, they think crime. Uh, yet we want to um, argue that the association works in a different way as well. When people think about crime, they think about black people. Thinking about crime draws attention to black Americans. Under these conditions, blacks are placed under surveillance. So let me give you an example of this. Um, the next um, couple studies I want to present have to do with racial profiling. And the first study uh, we conducted this time with white uh, male undergraduates. Um, and um, this time, half of these um, participants were subliminally primed um, with crime relevant objects on the computer screen. So I just showed you that in slow motion. And then next, all of the uh, students were asked to uh, complete this dot probe task. And for the dot probe task, participants um, saw a black face and a white face appear on the computer screen simultaneously. These faces disappeared, and then a faint dot appeared where one of the faces used to be, okay? And participants were asked to locate that dot as quickly as possible on the computer screen. Now, you might think um, that you'd be faster to locate that dot if you were already looking in that direction. And in fact, um, we use the speed at which participants can locate that dot as a proxy for visual attention. So for example, if they were quick to notice the dot um, when it was placed near the black face, chances are that they were looking at the black face. They were looking in that direction before the face disappeared. And we predicted that participants who had been flashed with these crime objects would be faster at finding the dot uh, near the black face um, than uh, those who had not been 
exposed to those crime objects. So the idea is that when we get people to think about crime, they'll begin to look at the black face. So here are the results for this. Uh, this time along the vertical axis, we have the mean reaction time to locate the dot, and this is in milliseconds. And first, we're going to look at what happens when they're not exposed to any crime objects. They just see the faces, the faces disappear, and then they locate the dot. Okay, so you can see here um, that they're faster to locate the dot when it's near the white face than when that dot is placed near the black face. Now, they're finding the dot faster because they're looking at the white face, okay? So um, when there's no manipulation at all, when they're not seeing any crime objects or anything at all, there's an in-group bias going on where the white study participants are uh, preferring to look um, at the white face. Okay, now when the students are primed to think of crime, you get the opposite effect. They look at the black face. Okay, so exposing people to these crime objects place uh, the black male faces under surveillance. Questions about this? Now we repeated this uh, same study with police officers. And the question here was, when the police are on the lookout for criminal activity, when they're thinking about violent crime, Will this lead them to focus on black faces? And this study, you know, again, is similar to the one that I uh, just showed you, but this time we um, exposed um, half of our police officers to words associated with violent crime rather than images. So we exposed these officers to words like apprehend, arrest, capture, shoot. And you can see here that the pattern of results is identical to what we see with the students. When the police officers are thinking of shooting and arresting and capturing, they're drawn to the black face. So let me pause here um, and um, tell you a story. I like telling stories. So, uh, I have a couple to tell. Um, but uh, several years ago, I was flying back to uh, California with my son, um, who was just five years old at the time. And we were in Boston. And my husband was teaching um, at uh, the Harvard Law School um, as a visiting scholar as part of um, what they call the J term. I guess they have that all around the country. So he was teaching for a few weeks there. So we went and spent like the first week with him. Um, and then my son and I, so he stayed there and my son and I were traveling uh, back um, on, on the plane alone. And so my son is, um, we're on the plane and he looks up and he sees this black man. And, uh, and in fact, he's the only black man on the plane. And um, he says, that guy looks like daddy. And I said, oh, okay. I looked at the guy, and he didn't look anything like my husband. I said, okay. First of all, this guy had, like, really long dreadlocks. You know, it was, like, going down his back. And my husband is bald. And I said, oh, okay. And, um, you know, I looked at the height. My husband was at least, like, five inches, six inches maybe taller uh, than this guy. Looked at the um, complexion. I looked at the facial structure. Just nothing at all similar. So... I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have a little talk, you know, with my son about this. But before I could say anything, he um, looks up again and he says, I hope he doesn't rob the plane. <laughs> and I said, what? I said, what did you say? And he said it again. I hope he doesn't rob the plane. And I said, what? I said, why would you say that? I said, you know, daddy wouldn't rob a plane. And he said, yeah, I know. And I said, well, why did you say that? And he says, well, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I was thinking that. We are living with such severe racial stratification that even a five-year-old can tell you what's supposed to happen next. Even with no evildoer, even with no explicit hatred, the Black Crime Association remains. My son lives in a state where only 9% of the population is black, yet 25%, at least 25% of those incarcerated are black. The state of California also has the most punitive three strikes law in the country. Um, a repeat offender can get a life sentence for almost uh, any crime if that offender had um, two prior convictions for serious or violent felonies. Uh, currently, 8,000 people are serving life sentences under three strikes in the state of California, and a full 45% of those serving three strike sentences are black. In the next study I want to show you, we were interested in the extent to which 
Racial disparities like these influence our psyches, um, and in particular, how such disparities might influence our support for punitive crime policies. So uh, for this study, we went to uh, train stations in Santa Clara County. Uh, this is the county that contains Palo Alto and Stanford University and so forth. And um, we collected data on people's support for three strikes. And we approached uh, train riders uh, to participate um, in this study. And they were told that the study was designed to better understand um, people's views about various social issues confronting the state. Okay, And using iPads, we showed them um, some of the images of people who are currently incarcerated. Um, so for half of the study uh, participants, um, they uh, saw this set of images. where 25% uh, of the in, uh, inmates depicted here are um, black. Uh, actually, they saw um, each of these faces for a half a second each, but I'm <laughs> trying to speed it up uh, 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 for presentation purposes here. So, um, and now the remaining participants saw this set of uh, faces. And in this set, 45% of the uh, inmates depicted are black. And this higher percentage, percentage again, is the, the true percentage of three strike inmates uh, who are black in California. And next, we informed uh, participants that an effort had begun uh, to amend the three strikes uh, law in the state of California. So, um, the, the, so the idea here is to amend it so that the third strike or the third crime uh, an offender commits has to be a violent crime um, in order for the three strikes law to take effect. Um, and at the very end of the study, we gave them the option uh, to sign a petition um, to have that amendment uh, placed on the ballot in November. And this is all true. Sometimes uh, social psychologists do studies where there are deception studies. <laughs> but this, there's no deception here. Like, there is an amendment, um, or people are trying to get petitions to uh, put that amendment um, on the ballot um, in November uh, in the state. And so, you know, so it's a real thing. And we uh, told them if they signed uh, the, the petition that we would actually forward their signatures uh, uh, so that their signatures could be counted, which we did. Okay. All right. So what did we find? So first, let's look at those who um, saw um, a sample of the prison population that was less black. Okay. So these people saw the sample that was 25% uh, black. And you can see here that about half of these people uh, signed the petition to amend the law, um, and about half of them don't. Okay. Now, what about the people who were exposed to the prison population that was more black? You can see here only 28% of the people mm -hmm sign that petition. So the more black the prison population is, the more willing people are to let the three strikes law stand as is. So the more willing uh, they are to support um, a punitive uh, policy. So, so the racial disparity um, in incarceration uh, not only is affecting those people who are behind bars, it's affecting all of us. It's affecting how we think, how we reason. Um, it's affecting uh, the probability that we will take action. And we not only act uh, punit more punitively the more black the prison population appears to be, but we act more punitively the more um, uh, black a particular defendant uh, appears to be. So in this next study, my colleagues and I were interested in how physical appearance um, could influence death <coughs> sentencing decisions. When jurors are deciding whether to punish someone with death or not, uh, to some extent they're deciding uh, what an adequate payment is to right the wrong that has been committed. They're deciding on what type of payback would be just. And this just desserts uh, perspective on punishment is well represented in the work of the uh, great Enlightenment thinker, Immanuel Kant. He says here, punishment should be pronounced over all criminals proportionate to their internal wickedness. Okay, proportionate to their internal wickedness. So in our research, we asked the question, could physical features that mark race be a proxy for internal wickedness? And if so, are black defendants who look more black um, uh, more likely to be perceived as wicked and punished accordingly? When we consider real defendants who've been convicted of first degree murder, who should get life? and who should get death. Perhaps an overlooked 
factor in understanding how the death penalty is decided upon has to do with Kant's notion of internal wickedness. Perhaps still today, American citizens look upon a black face and use the blackness of his physical features as a proxy for internal wickedness. And so we address this issue by uh, using a large data set of uh, death eligible defendants that was put together by the late um, David Baldus and his colleagues. Um, this is a criminologist who does work on race and the death penalty. And we were able to locate um, the faces of those that were in that uh, database. And, and we gave these faces to participants to um, rate the faces on stereotypicality. Now these participants had no knowledge of what the study was about. They had no knowledge of you know, who, the, who these people were. They just saw a face and they rated it on stereotypicality. And we were interested in whether those stereotypicality ratings, whether we could use those to predict who got a life sentence and who got a death sentence. Now the data I'm about to show you are for black defendants only. And you can see here, when you look at black defendants who were convicted of killing black victims, there's absolutely no stereotypicality effect. So the black uh, defendants who are rated as high in stereotypicality are sentenced to death at about the same rate as those who are rated low in stereotypicality. However, when you look at black defendants who are convicted of killing white victims, there's a huge stereotypicality effect, okay? Um, looking more black more than doubles uh, your chance of receiving a death sentence. And this effect is significant even though we control for things like aggravators and mitigators and the severity of the crime, we even uh, control for the defendant's attractiveness. And whatever we control for, we found that black defendants appear to be punished in proportion to the blackness of their physical features. Now, uh, this result uh, resonates with decades of research demonstrating that convicted uh, criminals are more likely uh, to be sentenced to death when their victims are white. So perhaps um, the internal uh, wickedness of the defendants matters most when the victims are most worthy of saving. Perhaps this result underscores um, how people still today value the lives of whites more so than the lives of blacks. So in the second part of my talk, I will present studies uh, designed to look at the most extreme form of black devaluation. I will argue that black people are not only viewed as more criminal, but as somehow less human uh, than whites. One of the oldest race battles blacks have fought in this country has been the battle to be recognized as fully human. Um, in 1934, W.E.B. Du Bois writes about this issue um, in the foreword to his classic book, Black Reconstruction. And he says here, it will be only fair to the reader to say frankly in advance that the attitude of any person toward this story will be distinctly influenced by his theories of the Negro race. If he believes the Negro in America and in general is an average and ordinary human being, who on the given environment develops like other human beings, then he will read this story and judge it by the facts adduced. If, however, he regards the Negro as a distinctly inferior creation, who can never successfully take part in modern civilization, and whose emancipation and enfranchisement were gestures against nature, then he will need something more than the sort of facts I have set down. But this latter person, I'm not trying to convince, I'm simply pointing out these two points of view, so obvious uh, to Americans. And then, without further ado, I'm assuming the truth of the first. And fine, I'm gonna tell this story as though Negroes were ordinary human beings, realizing that this attitude will, from the first, seriously curtail my audience. One of the oldest race battles blacks have fought in this country has been the battle to be recognized as fully human. I have begun um, to study this battle. And along with my collaborators, I've been documenting how blacks have become associated with apes in particular. And in numerous studies, we've examined how this black ape association still reaches us and can come to influence our perception and our actions. In uh, one study, for example, we examine how uh, the Black Ape Association can fundamentally alter um, what we see and don't see. So this is a study uh, that's um, 
quite similar to the very first study I showed you. In this study, uh, we primed people with black faces or white faces or no faces at all. And this time, um, we presented them with a series of images that were severely degraded, but all of these images were of animals, and sometimes they were of apes, and, and sometimes they were of non-apes, like ele um, alligators and squirrels and elephants and so forth. Okay, so what do we find? Um, again, along the vertical axis, we have the frame number at which people could recognize the images from frame one where it's blurry to frame 41 where it's clear. And we see that there's no effect of, of exposure to black faces or white faces beforehand on the non-ape uh, images. Yet we get a pattern that's altogether different um, for the ape images. Simply exposing people to black faces beforehand um, leads people to need less information um, to detect those ape images. They need fewer frames. Um, so black faces facilitated the detection of the ape images, whereas white faces inhibited the detection of those very same images. And for this particular study, we used both white and non-white participants, yet once again, the, the race of the study participants made no difference. Everyone exhibited um, the same pattern of responses. We conducted another study on visual detection that I'd like to talk about. In this study, we had people watch this famous perception video and count the number of passes, as you did at the beginning of my talk. However, we added an extra twist. Um, just before showing that video, we um, exposed people uh, to a series of stereotypically black names or to a series of stereotypically white names. Now, we exposed them to these names by just uh, giving listing the names on a sheet of paper, and we asked them to look at the names and uh, reorder the names in order of uh, popularity in, in the U.S., okay? And we found that when people were exposed to the white names beforehand, about 45% of them noticed the gorilla. So this is quite similar uh, to other studies on inattentional blindness. However, when people were exposed to the stereotypically black names beforehand, 70% of them noticed the gorilla. So here the gorilla was brought into the footlights of attention. Uh, the idea of blacks as apes pulls the gorilla out of darkness. Yet what is dimmed in the process? What don't we see? What don't we hear? And as a result, what actions do we then interpret as justified? In this next study, uh, we address these questions. Um, this study was actually inspired uh, by Anna Devere Smith. I don't know how many people know who she is. She does these one-woman shows, and um, she did a, a one-woman show on the Rodney King beating um, called Twilight. Um, and to prepare for the show, um, she asked, you know, she talked to various people involved in the case, and I was reading about this um, in a, a magazine article she had written for this acting magazine. Um, and. Um, so she was saying how she uh, talked to you know, all these people who were involved in the case, and she tells this story about um, talking to Rodney King's aunt. And she um, you know, describes, um, the aunt describes what it was like to see her nephew being beaten on television, and she described how her heart hurt um, when she heard him holler. Yet when Anna Devere Smith um, talked to the jury members, who were involved in the case, um, she learned that they had trouble hearing his hollers. And in fact, one jury member told her that they had to play the tape over and over and over again before they could hear him cry out. And ultimately, they had to turn the, um, the uh, video off. They had to remove his black body from sight before people were finally able to hear him, his screams. And you know, I read this, and I thought, oh, you know, it was just so disturbing. And, I, and, and it was one of those things where I, I, it kept coming back to me, and then I would just reread it, and it was just, you know, it was this thing that was disturbing. And, and, you know, a lot of people, when they get disturbed by something, they might write a song about it, or they might, you know, write a poem about it. But I collect data, you know. <laughs> That's what I do, you know. <laughs> so I rounded up some undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> so come on in to the lab. <laughs> and um, we showed them, uh, you know, a tape of a suspect who was being beaten by the police. And it was similar to the Rodney King th uh, thing, but it wasn't, you know, the actual Rodney King uh, beating. And so, um, no, we added an extra twist, of course. Uh, we, um, we wanted to um, know whether, um, 
you know, activating this animal imagery in a situation like this, whether this would change uh, people's uh, perceptions. So just before showing the tape, um, we exposed some of our study participants to words associated with apes. And so there it is in slow motion. And then next we asked the participants to watch a video of the police detaining a suspect and then to evaluate what happened. So I have that tape with me and I want to play it in its entirety. It's only two minutes. And I want to, I'm going to hope um, that the uh, audio works here. Let's see. Okay, so that's it. Um, let me just uh, remind you of the procedure here. Um, so participants were exposed to words associated with great apes or not. They watched the video, and then we asked them how justified and necessary was the use of force displayed in that video. And what did we find? Um, first, um, we find that participants were uh, much more likely to feel that the use of force was justified when they had first been exposed to um, these ape words before watching the tape. So when participants were primed to think, you know, gorilla and ape, they thought the black suspect was much more uh, deserving of the treatment he got. They were more likely to believe that the suspect brought that uh, kind of, of treatment onto himself. And so we see here that animal imagery increases um, people's thirst for state violence uh, directed at blacks. We also gave participants, oh, go ahead. Okay, did you, did you do, use a white state? We did. We had, yeah, I, I, and I kind of skipped that just for the time, you know, just to uh, save time, but you don't get the effect with the white face. Um, it only happens with the black face. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't that very important in what we do in war as well? Go ahead. Um, and because people in Vietnam. Oh, right, to dehumanize the other, the enemy, uh, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and it's used because it's a technique that works. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So um, at the very end of the study, um, we gave participants a, a surprise uh, recall task, and um, we had them watch two video clips. Uh, one was the original video, and the other we um, modified by splicing out the suspect's screams for help. Um, and the participants' goal was to tell us which of the videos was the original. Okay, and we found that when participants were not primed um, to think about um, apes, um, almost 90% of them um, could tell us which video they saw. So they're pretty accurate. However, when participants were primed with apes, their accuracy is drastically reduced. Okay, they can't tell what they saw. They can't tell what they heard. We're prepared to see and hear certain things and not others. And this perceptual readiness might be felt in the courtroom as well. So in the next study, uh, we were interested in you know, how ordinary citizens uh, might evaluate the use of animal imagery in the courtroom. And so the question is, when a defendant is called an animal or a brute or a creature, how do ordinary citizens respond? Do such terms uh, shock and offend us or are people ready to accept uh, such terms as fair um, and as proper and as um, necessary? 
So to examine these issues, we took information uh, from the following case. This is the state of Louisiana versus Edward Harris. Uh, this is a 1995 uh, case that involved a black uh, defendant who was convicted of murder uh, for the fatal uh, shootings of a man and a woman. And we uh, manipulated the race of the defendant such that for half of our study participants, Harris is presented as a black um, um, uh, defendant, whereas the remaining half he's presented as white. Um, participants then read the closing statement by the prosecution during the penalty phase of the trial, where she argued strongly for a death sentence. And in the closing statement, she uses animal imagery um, over and over again. So for example, she says here, you people, you 12 people are what stands between us and the defendant's jungle, the jungle that this animal over here has created. Okay, um, so we then asked our study participants to tell us whether they thought such language was fair, whether it was appropriate, and whether it was necessary. And we find that people are more likely to view um, this animal imagery um, as unproblematic, as appropriate and necessary when the defendant is described as black than when that very same defendant is described as white. So for a black defendant, animal imagery is more likely to be viewed as a natural description that's unfiltered um, by history, that's unfettered by where um, the participants themselves are standing. Now, you might imagine um, that if this animal imagery is deemed more necessary and appropriate uh, for black defendants, it also might be more prevalent um, in the cases of black defendants. Um, so in this study, we were interested in the extent to which animal imagery might appear in the popular press um, and whether we could use the prevalence of this animal imagery to gauge whether a defendant would be sentenced to life or death. And so for this study, we took a uh, data set that contained defendants um, who were convicted of crimes uh, committed in Philadelphia, and they became eligible for death um, somewhere between 1979 and 1999. Uh, this is that same uh, data set that I referred to in an earlier study. It was constructed by uh, David Baldus and colleagues. We then attempted to locate news articles written about these defendants, um, and um, we looked here um, in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and uh, we had naive raiders um, rate these news articles on animal imagery. So they code coded these news articles um, for words um, like animal and barbarian barbaric and predator and so forth. And we found significantly more animal related words in the news articles um, uh, describing black defendants than the news articles describing white defendants. And the news articles uh, for those black defendants who received death contain more animal related words than those news articles uh, for those who received a life sentence. So not only are blacks uh, associated with animals, but this association is linked to justifications of, of violence and death. The rules for what a moral treatment is um, are shifted for black suspects and defendants. And this moral disregard has a long history. Uh, we need only um, look to the great uh, Enlightenment thinkers for an example of this. Um, so um, Hegel, for instance, uh, says here, the Negro is an example of animal man in all his savagery and lawlessness. And if we wish to understand him at all, we must put aside all our European attitudes. We must not think of a spiritual God or of moral laws. To comprehend him correctly, we must abstract from all reverence and morality and from everything which we call feeling. All this is foreign to a man in his immediate existence, and nothing consonant with humanity is to be found in his character. It can be seen that intractability is the distinguishing feature of the Negro character. The condition in which they live is incapable of any development or culture, and their present existence is the same as it has always been. So from Hegel, we learn that blacks are less than human, that they are to be treated with moral disregard, um, and that like lower animals, they are incapable of growth and development. They are static beings. And it's this last theme that I'd like to uh, turn to in my final um, minutes here. Um, like the association of blacks with apes, this association of blacks with fixedness has a long history. Um, in fact, our own Thomas Jefferson addresses this issue directly um, in the following uh, passage where he discusses the character of black slaves. He says here, 
It will be right to make great allowances for the difference of condition, of education, of conversation, of the sphere in which they move. Most of them indeed have been confined to tillage, to their own homes and their own society. Yet many have been so situated that they might have availed themselves of the conversation of their masters. Many have been brought up in the handicraft arts and from that circumstance have always been associated with whites. Some have been liberally educated and all have lived in countries where the arts and sciences are cultivated to a considerable degree and have had before their eyes samples of the best work from abroad. The Indians, with no advantages of this kind, will often carve figures on their pipes not destitute of design or merit. They will crayon out an animal, a plant, or a country so as to prove the existence of a germ in their minds which only wants cultivation. They astonish you with the strokes of the most sublime oratory, such as prove their reason and sentiment strong, their imagination glowing and elevated. But never yet could I find that a black had uttered a thought above the level of plain narration, never seen an elementary trait of a painting or sculpture. Their inferiority is not the effect merely of their condition in life. It is not their condition, but nature, which has produced this distinction. So we see here that slavery was no excuse. In fact, Jefferson saw slavery as a benefit, as further proof that blacks were incapable of growth. And this view of blacks as fixed um, was present not only in the minds of our founding fathers, but it's still present in the minds of ordinary citizens. We conducted a study um, in our lab to, to test this. We um, used a familiar uh, technique now. We uh, subliminally primed them with black faces or white faces or no faces at all. And this time we had them complete an implicit theories measure. This was a measure developed by um, my colleague, uh, Carol Dweck. And it's designed to measure the extent to which people view others as fixed and, un fixed and unchangeable or as malleable and capable of growth. Um, so for example, um, one item on the scale reads, uh, people can do things differently, but the important parts of who they are can't really be changed. Uh, oops, another item, people can always uh, substantially change the kind of person they are. So to, to the extent that you endorse items like this first one, um, you're said to have a fixed um, mindset about uh, the capacities of others. And we found in this study that priming people with black faces increased the likelihood um, that they would endorse a fixed mindset. So blackness and fixedness are indeed linked. They're still linked. And my collaborators and I wanted to argue that this association can easily uh, influence how black defendants are uh, perceived. And so um, in the next study, we told people about a criminal case. Um, and for this study, we used a national sample um, of adults who completed the uh, study online. And for half of the um, study participants, um, the defendant's name in the case was Darnell, and he was described as black. Now, uh, the remaining participants read about the same criminal case, but um, the defendant's name was Adam, and he was described as white. And then they learned that the defendant uh, was convicted of uh, murder after fatally stabbing someone, and after reading more details about the case, they were asked, uh, um, to what extent uh, do you believe this defendant can change? Um, and uh, so here they were asked like questions like, you know, to what extent will this defendant be violent for the rest of his life and so forth. And we found um, that people were significantly more likely uh, to believe that black Darnell was uh, incapable of change than they were to believe that white Adam was incapable of change. Moreover, we found that the association of blacks with fixedness influenced how people viewed the criminal justice system more broadly. So, uh, for example, when we asked, um, you know, what the primary uh, goal of imprisonment should be, uh, we found that people were more likely to say punishment um, when they were prompted to think of Black Darnell and to say rehabilitation when they were prompted to think of White Adam. And this Black fixedness association is even apparent when we consider juveniles. Juveniles are typically thought of as malleable. They're thought of as not fully developed. Uh, they're works in progress. Um, um, so they're seen as just the opposite of fixed. And because of this, um, in our criminal justice system, juveniles are typically viewed as less culpable than adults who commit similar crimes. And in fact, um, just a couple of years ago, 
Um, two, there were two cases um, uh, involving juveniles were, that were brought uh, before the Supreme Court. Um, and here the court was deciding on the legality of sentencing a juvenile to life in prison with no possibility for parole um, in non-homicide cases. Okay, um, and so we took one of these cases, the Sullivan case, um, and we modeled a study after it. And this is the last study I'll uh, present um, this evening. Um, this time, uh, we used a nationally representative sample of, of white Americans who, uh, again, they completed the study online. And um, participants were told that the Supreme Court was reviewing uh, life without parole sentences for juveniles uh, in, in these non-homicide cases. Um, and they all read about the Sullivan case. And um, we described Sullivan's history um, and the crime uh, for which he was given a life sentence. Um, and we changed only one word uh, in the entire study. Um, you know, for half the participants, uh, we told them that uh, Joe Sullivan was a black male. For the remaining half, we said he was a white male. We then asked participants whether they supported life in prison without the possibility uh, for parole in cases like this, where no one was killed. And we found um, that participants were significantly more likely to support um, uh, this policy when Joel Sullivan was described as black than when he was described um, as a white. And describing Sullivan as black also led participants to view juveniles in general as uh, significantly more similar to adults in their culpability. And in fact, when we put all these results together in one model, we find that bringing to mind a black juvenile leads people to see juveniles in general as more culpable. And this enhanced culpability leads the, uh, to greater support for life sentences uh, for juveniles. So the effect of um, race on support for um, life sentences is due to this shift in um, how people reason about culpability. All right, um, a couple of years ago, I um, visited the Equal Justice uh, Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, so I'm going to end with this uh, story. Um, along uh, the hallway walls, I remember um, seeing uh, photographs of defendants, and under each photograph there was a, a uh, quote, um, and here is uh, one of those uh, quotes that stuck with me. I am more uh, than the worst thing I've ever done. I am more than the worst thing I've ever done. There's a call here to all of us to see more. Yet the quote really underscores the fact that many of us see nothing more. We see the gorilla, nothing more. And just as we would think about an animal, um, the potential for growth and change is not imagined. There's no potential. For many people, these defendants are now all they were born to be. Unlike many people, Buck Franklin was an observant witness. And he is calling on all of us now uh, to see more as well. And when we, we can, when we can see more, when we do see more, we honor him. Thank you. Thank you for that really wonderful presentation. Um, we got started just a little bit late, so we have time for um, just a few questions, maybe five minutes of questions. So if anyone would like to question, I, I'm going to ask you to come up to the microphone so that it'll be on the uh, recording that we're making of this that we can post on our, on our web page. Um, we have sometimes difficulty getting the audio from the overhanging mic, so be the first guinea pig here. I found, like a lot of people did, highly offensive some of the language from State v. Harris and also from uh, Hegel. But let me ask you a question. Um, one of the things I thought about when you were presenting all this associational evidence is that we usually start from the proposition that the more we know, the better decisions we make and the fairer our decisions will be. But yet, from all this associational evidence, seems to me to suggest the less we know, the better perhaps and more fair our decisions would be. I mean, after all, when you mm -hmm. look at the associ associational evidence between names and the ape, uh, 
right. uh, between uh, incarceration, race, and whether you're going to get rid of uh, three strikes and your outlaws in California. Right. That pushes us the wrong direction. Wouldn't we better be better off with less less information? Yeah, I, I know that's a great question. I I, I don't know. Uh, that that's true. I, I think we uh, need to understand how to grapple with the information that we have. I think the problem is not um, knowing more uh, because just being in society, it's absorbed. You know, the, the five-year-old can tell you what's happening without reading the papers, you know. So, so there's a way in which um, we, we pick it up. Um, so, so, so we, we have this knowledge and so the idea is to um, be able to confront that, to be able to talk about that, to um, be able to, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of figure out ways in, in which we can deal with it and to understand how it's affecting us, um, uh, not to not talk about it. In fact, you know, one of the things that was a bit surprising to me is that um, we, we started doing the work on the animal imagery after the work uh, we had started on crime. And it's it, it you know <laughs> we get this we would get this data back and it seemed like the association um, you know between blacks and apes was actually stronger uh, than the association between blacks and crime and and initially that was um, that was surprising you know because you know th this association between blacks and apes people don't you know talk about it um, uh, you know openly um, you know that's not something that you read about in the papers whereas with the crime statistics you do read about that. Um, you just don't have conversations about that, but then, you know, somehow it, that it's stronger, and, it, and maybe it's stronger, you know, because we aren't talking about it. Maybe it's stronger because we don't confront it, and and the way to handle it is not to um, shield ourselves from the information, but to learn how to deal more effectively uh, with that information. Thanks. Um, kind of piggybacking on that question. Um, we like to believe that we can buffer ourselves from this thinking to avoid it through education. Um, are there any um, reliable individual differences that you see in people's uh, tendency to react this way? Or what would you say to people who, if they take these tests and score how they wouldn't want to, you know, what, what would be the, the message there, I guess? Well, I, I'm actually more hopeful about <laughs> the dehumanization work than I am about the crime work. I think that there is a uh, you know, a way, um, there is an intervention, uh, so to speak, uh, with that. Um, so we have lots of other work that, I, you know, I didn't have time to pre present here, uh, looking at what sustains that association. So I just said, we, we're not, you know, talking about it every day. Like, you know, how is it that people are picking up on this? How is it that it still is with us? And um, we, and we think that part of the reason um, it has to do with um, lay notions of human evolution. You know, when people learn about human evolution, they walk away, um, um, you know, with this idea um, that, um, you know, you know, black people, people of African descent are, um, you know, closer uh, to apes. They walk away with this idea that, um, you know, modern, you know, in order to start modern civilization, uh, that people had to move away from Africa. You know, so they, they have these ideas that they um, bring with them, uh, you know, when they study evolution. And again, these are ideas that aren't directly confronted. So, um, you know, people don't, uh, when they learn about evolution, talk uh, directly about uh, race. And so, so, th so those ideas are allowed to, you know, stay with us unchallenged. And, um, and so we think that that is um, one of the, um, the issues. And so um, one way to deal with that, right, is, is to, you know, you know, sort of talk about and teach um, evolution uh, in a different way, um, which is um, in, in a way that's more accurate and in a way that doesn't have uh, these negative consequences for race relations. Um, so I feel like that task is actually... I don't know, it's, it's doable. <laughs> so, go ahead. I'm wondering how universal or normal this behavior is. Mm -hmm. Because in, in our country, whites are more privileged, more advantaged. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if similar studies have been done in other cultures which give similar or different results. <clears throat> there you go. Um, so we've done it um, in 12 um, other countries now. Um, this, is, this is looking at the... Um, the uh, Black Ape Association in other countries. I'm talking about in general, the, the oh. perceptions in, in our country yeah. of blacks as compared to whites that we've right. talked about this evening. Right. I'm wondering if that is normal, common around the world, or if yeah. some studies <laughs> have been done right. and, which give different results or similar results. Well, they seem similar. Um, 
in every uh, country where we've looked at the, um, uh, the Black Ape Association, um, you can see here that um, blacks are more highly associated with apes than uh, whites. Um, so, so, yeah, there it is. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I moved here from a place not only known for racial profiling, but for a 1906 racial lynching of three black men, one of whom happened to share a name with one of the victims of the Easter shootings that just occurred in Tulsa, a man named Will Allen. And I would just like to ask you if you think it is perhaps time to have some sort of national racial dialogue about the reality of our past, which could change our future. Yes. <laughs> I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. I was actually really struck when you were talking about the um, cries for help. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I thought about was Stam um, Stanford, Florida, and oh, how right. Trayvon Martin, yeah. um, it really, in, to my mind, kind of caught my attention, I think, the nation's attention when <coughs> audio clips were released. Yeah. And so when you talked about turning off the video, do yeah. you have any thoughts about that and how that you know, really took off where we couldn't see? Yeah, and, it, and it's really interesting to think about that in terms of Zimmerman, right? Because he had Trayvon's image in front of him. So, so, so maybe he wasn't registering his, you know, his, his, you know, his um, reaction. You know, maybe he was seeing um, anger and hostility um, rather than fear. You know, maybe, you know, so Zimmerman um, maybe didn't hear you know, the pleas for help in the way that we did, because w what we heard was an audio. It wasn't, um, we didn't actually see um, the scene. So that, that is really interesting. Um, it's really interesting parallel. So I think, I don't know if you, um, like recently, uh, that, this was just a few days ago, um, when, um, you know, uh, Zimmerman showed up in court, he was, he apologized uh, to, uh, the family, and he um, said that he was sorry that he didn't know how young he was, and that um, he thought that he uh, Trayvon Martin was closer to his age, and he didn't know if he had a weapon. And he, that kind of speaks to you know some of the things I was talking about later um, in the talk as well. That you know this, you know people don't see um, you know African American children as as children. Um, it appears that uh, public opinion is greatly influenced by the media. And it, um, I know here, where I live here in Tulsa, it just seems that a lot of the stories that are covered criminal um, acts, uh, um, more of them are reported uh, on blacks and very few stories. I don't yeah. think it's evenly reported any crimes that are committed by uh, whites versus blacks. Right. So do you think that the media really fuels this negative perception? And um, I guess that was really it. Does, does the media continue to perpetuate the way we feel about blacks, you know, the way that they report? I think so. One of the things that was um, strike, I didn't have time to talk about this either with the three strike study um, when we uh, were first setting it up. Um, well, I'll just tell you about just, just in looking at those conditions where you have um, the prison population that's less black, that's 25% versus the three strike uh, population that's more black, that's 45%. Um, when we asked uh, participants at the end of the study, um, you know, what they thought the percentage, uh, you know, of black was in the, in the state of California in the, in the um, prison system. So, so they didn't have, they weren't privy to those numbers, right? They, so they just saw the faces and were exposed to them and they were affected by them. Um, but they guessed numbers that were way above that, you know. So in the condition uh, where they were exposed to 20, 25% of the faces were black, um, I think they were guessing I think it was around 55% uh, of the 
um, you know, people incarcerated in the state of California are black. And then in the, in the um, condition where there was more black faces displayed, they were guessing like 65%. Um, so I think that has to do with media. You know, I think, um, you know, uh, people, it, so it, it's almost like, um, you know, the, the numbers are really bad. Um, and it's like, so people think that the numbers are actually worse than they are, and, and, and it leads them to be more punitive rather than more sympathetic. And maybe it leads them to be more punitive because of how um, you know, black people are depicted um, in, in the mass media. So, yeah, Good. did you have, okay, all right. Thanks, thanks for the question. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks.